Hello again. Um, in this last module of the class for this quarter, I am tackling some more advanced concepts having to do with Lisa. And there's two sets. In this first one, I talk about multivariate extensions of the concept of Lisa, which turns out to be much less straightforward than, than uh, one might think. And then in the second set, I'll talk about the application of Lisa to discrete variables, zero one variables. So um, the extension, as I said, of the concept of a Lisa to a multivariate setting, that's a setting where there's multiple variables considered uh, jointly, is not that straightforward. And I'll talk a little bit about that first before I go into two specific approaches. One is what I call a multivariate local Geary test and the other one a local neighbor match test. And both of these are very recent, um, uh, published in articles in 2019 and 2020. Um, so the problem with a multivariate spatial autocorrelation is that um, we have to really think about what it is that we are measuring because there, there are two things going on here. One, once you have more than one variable, you have the correlation or similarity, if you wish, among the different variables at the same location. That's one aspect. And then the other aspect is how that particular configuration of values for multiple variables is matched by similar configurations at the neighboring location. So it's actually, when you think about it, quite a complex concept where you have to uh, combine these two um, attributes. So before we get started, we have to really th think about you know, what it is that this multivariate spatial autocorrelation is. And uh, formally, you can say it's the similarity, just like before, similarity, high, high, low, low, we don't care, it's similarity of values for multiple attributes together. And that is called, in a technical language, a tuple. So a tuple is really um, the collection of the observations on multiple variables for one location, one observation. So how is that particular tuple at a location similar to tuples at neighboring locations? And as always, we're interested in conducting tests where we can assess how this is, the extent to which this actually confirms conforms with um, spatial randomness. So we don't, we, we need to know what particular configurations are likely to happen under spatial randomness and is what we observe at a particular location in terms of the values for multiple variables and how that is related to the values of multiple variables in the neighboring locations. How is that somehow quote unquote significantly different from what we uh, find under spatial randomness? And a critical aspect in this, as, as we've seen before in any spatial autocorrelation measure, is how we quantify attribute similarity. And if you recall in our early discussion of spatial autocorrelation, we talked about cross product similarity and then two measures of dissimilarity, square distances and absolute differences. Um, so the early work on multivariate spatial autocorrelation, first of all, focused on global statistics, not on local, and focused almost exclusively on Moran's eye. And Moran's eye is a cross product statistic. So how do you generalize a cross product statistic uh, when you have both um, correlation among the variables at the same location, as well as correlations across locations? So um, that's complicated and early efforts. And I, I, I just want you to know that this exists, this literature exists, but we won't dwell on it um, because first of all, it deals primarily with global statistics and we are focusing on the local ones. And also all these methods have some problems or sidestep the problem. Uh, the main way to sidestep is it, it, this issue is to 
focus on principal components and principal components we don't really talk about that in in this course but we will in the spring principal components are uncorrelated by construction so right off the bat this correlation business has been removed uh, from the equation and that's one of the advantages of using uh, principal components so there's a work by a number of different authors then an interesting article um, looks at how Moran's eye is really a combination of two things one has to do with the spatial similarity the other one with the correlation so under some fairly strong assumptions this uh, splits very nicely in a Pearson correlation and a spatial component but the essence of the problem is how do you separate correlation between the variables from correlation between tuples of variables so all of them together at different locations and so an alternative way to think about this and to really move away from this focus on the cross product which is admittedly very natural because it comes from thinking about correlation coefficients which are all about products so a different way to think about this and in, in my opinion a more natural way to think about it is to think about distances and two kinds of distances we've already used distances in geographic space to construct spatial weights but now we're going to look at distances in multi-attribute space and if you remember our data cube we had three variables and every observation was a point in the data cube and we could look at the distances between these points in the data cube and that idea is really central to the two approaches that I will discuss um, today in this lecture um, namely using the concept of distance in attribute space and comparing it to distance in geographic space and we've seen this from day one when we talked about what is an auto spatial autocorrelation statistic it's something that combines a measure of attribute similarity with a measure of um, locational similarity so now I make these two explicit both in terms of a distance metric this is actually the square distance it's the norm and uh, you can think of these x um, variables as a vector with um, all the different variables in it so the uh, distance between observation i and observation j uh, distance squared in attribute space is nothing but the sum over all the variables k going from 1 to p of the square difference between them so the actual distance then is the square root from this sum of square differences and for some methods we'll use the distance we've already seen this earlier when we looked at the um, distance scatter plot um, earlier where we plotted the geographic distance uh, and versus attribute distance well it's all along the same lines it's all using the same logic namely to what extent can we identify locations that are close in geographic space and in attribute space and to make it concrete think, think of your 3d data cube we want to identify groups of points in the 3d data cube that are close together we've already um, saw this earlier when we did the rotation and the zooming in to identify if you wish clusters of points points that are close together in attribute space but now we want to also find out are these points close in geographic space so there's a tension between these two how do we uh, deal with that tension how can we come up with a summary measure that then would be a statistic for multivariate spatial autocorrelation so that's the challenge and the approach we take is based on these two notions of distances that we try to play against each other so the first uh, statistic is a multivariate extension of the local Geary statistic we talked about Geary when we discussed um, 
global spatial autocorrelation, and I won't repeat it here, but basically the difference between Geary C and Moran's I is that Moran's I uses a cross product measure of attribute similarity, and Geary C uses the square distance. So now let's think about just two variables and how do we measure the distance in attribute space between these two observations, i and j, that are measured in terms of two variables. So think of a scatter plot and you have two points in the scatter plot. What is the distance, or in this case square distance, between these two points? And that's simply the square of the Euclidean distance, the difference on the first dimension squared, plus the difference on the second dimension squared, and then the distance would be the square root of this, but we don't need to take the square root, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we now have a notion in a scatter plot. We have two observations, how far are they apart, right? Now we switch this around and focus on an individual observation and find its geographic neighbors. So you can think in a scatter plot, you know, in uh, we've we've seen how to do this earlier in the lab when you find the selected and their neighbors. So you get a point, you select it and their neighbors, and then you see where those neighbors are in the scatter plot. What are the distances from the point that we're interested in to the neighbors in the scatter plot? So we take each of these distances, or square distances, as the case may be, and then we average them for the neighbors. That's actually exactly what Geary C does uh, in a univariate context. Now all we do is extend this to a multivariate context. And because these are Euclidean distances, they're just sums of squares, it's very easy to decompose this. This, this is algebraically very simple. So for any location i, we take the neighbors, wij, that is not zero, and then we take the square distance to these neighbors j, and we average them. So we take the weights, we just saw here, this is the distance in two dimensions, so we put this in the parentheses, and we can rewrite this, I mean it's a little cumbersome, but in a second you see why we do this, we rewrite this as the first term plus the second term, each pre-multiplied by these weights. Now let's look at these more closely. What exactly is this? This is for a given observation i, the weighted sum, weighted by the spatial weights, of the square distances to its neighbors j. This is exactly the local Geary C. So, in two dimensions, a two-dimensional local Geary C is nothing but the sum of the two one-dimensional local Geary C. It's a very simple algebraic result, but it's actually very useful because now it means that we can uh, construct a multivariate local Geary statistic from the univariate local Geary statistics. So the multivariate local Geary then is simply the sum over all the variables up to k of the weighted squared attribute distance to the neighbors. Or if you wish, is just the sum of the local Geary statistics for each variable in turn. And then what we do to keep the scale similar, because as you have more variables, obviously the sum will get larger and larger, we divide it by the number of variables involved. So this is actually the operational measure of the multivariate local Geary that we implement in Geoda, which is, in, an, you know, in a nutshell, it's the average of the local Geary's for all the variables for, with respect to that location. So we have our statistic, now what is the inference? And this is actually a little bit complicated and, and not quite fully resolved. So I'm going to take, as I've done before, a very practical approach, namely that you have to carry out sensitivity analysis.
to see how these results vary with the different decisions that you make. It's not that straightforward because you thought we had a problem with the univariate leases in terms of the multiple comparison problem, the false discovery rate, the Bonferroni bounds, all those different things. That's one form of multiple comparisons, but here we have another one. In addition, we have the multiple variable problem, which raises the question of what are the actual uh, degrees of freedom. And then we also have always the same for the univariate LISA, potentially influence of global autocorrelation for each of the individual variables. So in a nutshell, it's a mess. And so what we, um, what I chose to do in this situation is to fall back on a computational approach using a con conditional permutation approach, same way as for the univariate case, but be very careful in the interpretation of significance. Now, the, um, the conditional permutation approach is a little bit different from before because we do want to maintain the existing structure of the correlation among the variables. So we do not shuffle them around one at a time, but we shuffle the whole tuple around together. So if you have, say, three variables, then we have the three variables observed at all our locations. We keep the location of interest fixed, and then we shuffle the other ones around and then compute the multivariate local Geary many, many times and see how that uh, relates to the actual observed value in the same, using the same logic as before. How do we interpret this? No more high, high and low, low because everything is pulled together. So whereas for the univariate local Geary, we could with some trickery using the Moran scatter plot, uh, draw some conclusions as to whether these were clusters of high values or low values. Now, because we have multiple variables, there's actual internal trade-offs going on. So what we could have is for one or two variables, very small values of the local Geary, and then a third and a fourth have very large values. So the average is kind of m messed up. And so the multivariate interaction is actually very complicated and not always easy to understand. And so um, when you have a much smaller multivariate local Geary, in essence, that means that the average of the individual local Geary's is very small, smaller than it would be under spatial randomness. Then we conclude that we have a cluster of similar values. And the opposite is a cluster of dissimilar values, which is where the value would be larger than you would expect under spatial randomness. In my experience, I don't see that much of it. Uh, in, same thing in the univariate case. The predominant focus of these, or the power, if you wish, of these tests tends to be um, towards clusters of similar values. So it's important to keep in mind that, and, and you know, you could just think of our discussion of a spatially lagged variable, which is an average of the neighbors. But if you have outliers, that outlier can pull the average in a particular direction. It's the same thing here. The multivariate local Geary statistic is in essence an average of the individual local Geary statistics. So any kind of extreme, very small or very large value in the individual local Geary can pull the average in a particular direction. So there's actually very complicated uh, trade-offs going on. And so you might say, well, is this useful? Well, surprisingly so, but only in my experience, if you focus on the cases that are extremely significant, not the 0.05s at all, and even 0.01 marginally, but the ones that hit, you know, one in a thousand, one in 10,000, those are really um, worthy of attention and actually turn out to give pretty interesting um, interpretations and pretty interesting results. And so um, the end result, we have two end results, just like before, we have a significance map, um, which actually in this case is much more 
interesting and useful than it is in the in the univariate case. And in practice, in the univariate case, we tend to focus on the cluster map because it gives us the high high and low low interpretation. Here, the cluster map is actually less informative in that sense that we cannot um, make draw those kind of conclusions. And really, what we find are locations for which the distances to their neighbors in attribute space are very small, smaller than they would be in spatial randomness. So it is a summary of similarity or dissimilarity in multivariate attribute space. So one way you can think about this, and actually I'll illustrate some of that in a few minutes, is you know you can um, and you can do this in Geoda. You can explore this yourself, where you look at the individual observations and you see how far the neighbors are, and then you kind of compute the average distance to the neighbors and see how that stacks up. And so that's the way to think about it. This is, and we see this. We'll see this again. Um, well, not in this course, but when we discuss spatial clustering, it's always about the same thing. It's this tension between attribute similarity, which is you know basically points in your data cube that are close together, and then geographic similarity, which is locations on a map that are close together. And that tension is doesn't always have a straightforward answer, so it's actually much more complex than the univariate case. And let me illustrate this. We go back to our Geary data set with uh, 85 departments in France. And this is just to give you a sense of how hard this is. So obviously, this, uh, this map uh, is a quintile map. This um, you know, simplifies a continuous distribution into discrete categories, so it's not ideal. But So what we're trying to find is not just locations that are similar on these three attributes, that is attribute correlation. So we're not just trying to find locations that are high on all three of these, but we're trying to find locations, whichever combination of values they have, that are similar to their neighbors whichever combination of values they have. That's really the concept of a multivariate spatial autocorrelation statistic. And you see right off the bat, it's not going to be that easy. So here we've used this data set before, and this particular variable donations are low here in the south and uh, east. And then similarly, crimes against persons seem to be low here, but then we don't have that pattern at all up here. And uh, we do seem to be having some similarity of high values in the middle, but uh, it's not that simple. And if we um, think about this back, you know, these are, and that's why I took an example with three variables, we can actually look at it in the data cube. And even if you spin this data cube around, it's not, and we've seen this before, it's not that straightforward. You might say, well, look at these two points seem really close together, but then if you spin the cube, you see that they're probably not that close together. So these are the kinds of things uh, to keep in mind in 3D visualization. Um, so now what we're going to do is um, look at the univariate local Geary's, and these are the significant locations. Again, not a lot of overlap, in fact, very little overlap, except maybe here again with the low, low clusters. So think about it. So what we're doing now with the multivariate local Geary is taking an average of the values for each of these individual local Geary's. And then we shuffle the tuples around many, many times and find the locations where uh, the result that we find is very different from what we find under this permutation um, uh, mimicking of spatial randomness, no hypothesis. So as I said, the, the, the really interesting parts are here. So there's uh, one of the problems with multiple variables is uh, 
what exactly is the p-value and a p-value of 0.05 or even 0.01 is probably not correct anyway. So what I do in practice is I focus on the high end. So we have about five observations here. They all are around here, which is the same region that we've found over and over again. And now you see what I mean by the significance map uh, being actually more informative than in the univariate case because this just tells us there are clusters but it doesn't really tell us much more about these clusters in contrast to say in a Moran cluster map or in the local Geary cluster map we just saw in the previous slides where you know what kind of association it might be. Here you have no idea because in fact it's not between high and high, it's between the same profile on all three variables. So some may be high, some may be low. It's the similarity that matters. How close are these points in our data cube? And we can actually assess this. So if we take these um, two points here, we find them in the data cube and uh, they are very close together. Of course, I'm only giving you a particular perspective here, but they are close together. And if you rotate it, uh, they stay close together. But the interesting part is that, so these are the significant locations. As we've seen before, the meaning of a cluster is not just the core of the cluster, but it's the core and its neighbors. And the red lines connect each of these observations to their neighbors. And we see that some of these neighbors are close, like the two yellow ones happen to be neighbors of each other, but others are actually quite far in multi-attribute space. So this is to highlight the complexity of this measure and how it combines these distances in some kind of a summary measure. And um, I was really happy to see that in fact, the, this multivariate local Geary picks out interesting locations, locations where there is something going on and it's not some artifact of the calculation. Another um, nice confirmation, and this is a little beyond the scope of this class, but in the cluster class, when we deal with multiple variables, we use a dimension reduction technique called multidimensional scaling. And so, uh, in essence, these two points are very close together in high attribute space. And as it turns out, these are the two locations that we pick up with the multivariate local Geary. So again, you know my philosophy in this exploratory spatial data analysis is to use different approaches and to see if they bring out some interesting patterns and interesting locations. And in this case, we see the interesting aspect confirmed from at least three different perspectives, you know, look, using the multivariate local Geary, looking at the distances in the 3D data cube, and then on a multidimensional scaling two-dimensional plot. So that's the multivariate local Geary. The other approach uh, is actually much simpler in spirit. And this is the local neighbor match test. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time, but then I finally wrote it up this year. Uh, the idea is ex exactly what I've been saying over and over again, matching neighbors in attribute space with neighbors in geographic space. And the way we do this is by using uh, the concept of K nearest neighbors and finding out for each location what are the caneous neighbors in geographic space? We know how to do that. And in multi-attribute space. Actually, if you explore the lab notes a little beyond what I covered in class, you might know how to do that as well. So now we have two weights matrices and one has the neighbors in geographic space. The other one has the neighbors in multi-attribute space. And we know that we can um, show the network structure that corresponds to these spatial weights. And for our same example, but now using um, six variables, 
this is the geographic k nearest neighbor. So each of these connects to six neighbors. Uh, keep in mind, uh, this is not a symmetric graph. So some A can be a neighbor of B, where B is not a neighbor of A, which complicates it a little bit the way you interpret this. But this gives a sense. This is exactly what we expect, and neighbors are neighbors. Right? Then when you do this for the six variables in the example, you get this spaghetti mess. So this shows that some locations that may be close in attribute space, these lines in this graph connect a location, for example here, to a point that is close in multi-attribute space. Actually, this, the, the six closest points. So you see here, this closest point is very far removed. Same here. Look at these kind of connections. These are long, uh, sorry, long spans that do not match geographic closeness at all. But then there's some others, and it's a little hard to see, but they're around here, um, where that is not the case. So what's the idea behind a local neighbor match test is we take these two weights matrices and we find the intersection between them. So we find which links in the two graphs do the two weights have in common. And so those are IJ pairs, pairs of an observation and a neighbor that I have both nearest neighbors in geographic uh, terms and nearest neighbors in multi-attribute terms. And this intersection graph uh, <clears throat> is what I call a neighbor cardinality map. So for each location, the darker colors tell you how many neighbors the uh, geographic and the attribute k nearest neighbors weights have in common. So if we use k6, the largest number would be 6. In our example, there's no observation that has all six neighbors in common. But there's one observation that has five in common. Four observations have four in common. And then it goes up 16 have three, 28 two, 25 one. So the question then is, um, OK, this is all nice and good. We see there's something interesting going on here and maybe also here. Um, how do we interpret this in terms of significance? And actually, this is a classic probability problem. You know, out of six neighbors that we could have from all the observations in the data set, what are the chances that five of these are in common or four of these are in common? So we can compute this using um, this kind of little uh, I, I know a dreaded exercise in your intro stats class is find out what this probability is. You know, you um, card games or pulling ball, balls out of urns. So um, we, we can skip this, but basically it uses combinatorial logic. Uh, this K is the number of neighbors, uh, nearest neighbors. V is the number of neighbors we have in common. N is actually n minus 1, because remember, it's a com conditional upon the value you observe. So these are the remaining ones, and, and this is the difference uh, between k and v. So as v goes up, this becomes smaller, and then this is the overall combination of n minus 1 into groups of k. So we want to find out what is the probability of a shared neighbor, and this is a quick and dirty measure of significance, it allows us to simplify the graph. So with that probability in hand, we can find out which of these network connections are actually significant in, in some limited sense. Remember, you know, we I use the term significant, but I really mean interesting because we know from the multiple comparisons and all these other problems that the p-value is almost certainly not the correct one, but it does give us some insight. And just as we, as we know, uh, or we could suspect, if you have five 
neighbors out of six in common, that's not going to happen very often, right? Four, maybe less so. The question is, at what point do we cut it off? At what point do we say two neighbors in common? That is likely enough to happen under randomness, under the null hypothesis, that we shouldn't really pay any attention to this. So this p-value allows us to simplify the graph even more, or the, the map even more if you wish, and it shows us this particular location as well as the other ones that match the significance criterion. So this is a way, an alternative way, to um, find neighbors that are both close in attribute space and close in geographic space. Um, this can be easily extended, and in fact, that's beyond the scope of this course, but we'll revisit this later. You can look for neighbors in other spaces than the pure data cube, uh, especially with higher dimensions. We can simplify this a little bit. But one limitation, one serious limitation for really big data and in the sense of many, many, many variables is this empty space problem that I alluded to earlier in the discussion of multivariate EDA, in that as the number of dimensions in the attribute space increases, there is so much empty space between the data points that you have to search an inordinate share of the data space to find the nearest neighbors, which makes this very impractical. That, that's a cursive dimensionality problem as well. So what we've done here is uh, basically we know or we realize that cross products are very difficult to handle in higher dimensions. So I decided why not take a different perspective and just focus on the distances between the observations in attribute space and then the distances in geographic space. The multivariate local Geary summarizes that very neatly as basically a, an average of the individual local Geary's and then we have the usual problems with inference but nevertheless we do find some interesting locations. And then the last step, the local neighbor match test is a very simple device that takes the logic of nearest neighbors in attribute space and in geographic space, finds the intersection, and then uh, figures out how likely it is that these kinds of intersections might occur. And this brings out locations that are um, close in, in both these dimensions. This is what it's all about.